to staying the course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised Word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. I love your word. I love the way. You ready? Okay, we're going to jump in. First of all, I want you to know that this is the only book with prophecy that's been fulfilled 100%. Nostradamus has made some prophecies, but they were so elusive that they could apply to a lot of things. The Bible specifically prophesies about nations, about the geopolitical climate of the end times, and we're seeing it happen before our eyes. It is amazing. In Matthew, Jesus said to the Pharisees, hey, you know how to discern the weather, but can you not discern the signs of the times? You see, I believe God has given us signposts, and we're going to go over those this morning. It is amazing, and it flows with our text in Genesis because it's all about the Edomites and the Ishmaelites who literally became the Arab nations, the Persian nations, and all the Islamic states that we find today. And it is amazing. We're calling it the Omega Files. This is part two. Uh, they're declassified now. Dun, dun, dun. Genesis 28, 29. We know Esau uh, went to Ishmael and married one of Ishmael's daughters. The result of that is a lot of the people we find in the region today, in fact, a lot of them are called Edomites. And we're going to talk about who they are. Uh, that's kind of a, a look at the genealogy there. Abraham uh, from Sarah, he had Isaac, who then became Jacob in Israel. 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ came. Uh, from Hagar, we had Ishmael, the Arabs, Esau, the Edomites. They ca came together, and I believe it's the Palestinians. Uh, 2,600 years later came Muhammad who founded Islam, and that is what the powder keg of the Middle East is all about. Am I on? Check, check, check. Okay, yeah, I am on. I felt like I was having to shout. Shout, put your heels up. Shout. Okay, well, never mind. <laughs> Come on now. Is that a gospel song? Okay. <laughs> So we know that the eyes of the world are on Israel. We know in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2, that God said in the last days, I'm going to make Israel, this little nation, a trembling cup for the whole world. And all the news you read today is all about the Middle East and the conflict between Jacob, Israel, and Esau and Ishmael, all the Islamic states around there. It is pretty amazing. Again, here's this map, that little, little country called Israel, right in the middle of all those nations that want to destroy it. And yet, why haven't they been able to destroy Israel? Because God's hand has protected them. And if you read the stories, in 1948, when Israel declared its independence and uh, the forces uh, pulled out, and all those nations attacked Israel. Not all of them, but most of them. And guess what? Israel prevailed. With literally no army to speak of, they were making munitions underground at a cannery in Israel. They were actually going there at night and making their own bullets. And God somehow supernaturally made them prevail. Uh, ISIS, we need to talk about it. Now it's, they're just referred to as the Is Islamic State. And they are on the rise. It's estimated there's about 31,000 Islamic State fighters. Now, this was as of last week. Now there's a lot more because there's a new group. Have you heard of it in Egypt? Okay, we're going to talk about that. It's not on the, the, the big news yet. I don't know why. Do you know there's only 12 nations in the world that are not involved in a conflict today? That means every other nation in the world is involved in some sort of war, battle, civil war, or anything like that. There's wars being fought all over. There's only 12 nations that are at peace this morning. Matthew 24, literally as Jesus began to tell us the signs to look for, 
He said, man, you're going to be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened. And that's a promise we need to hold on to. Do not be frightened. You know, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God told us everything that was going to happen. He said, I'm going to sustain you and provide for you to the end. Do not fear. There are seven geopolitical alliances that the Bible talks about in the last days, and there they are. Uh, The first one is the remnant bride of Christ. I really believe that revival that began to spark uh, early in the 1900s, we began to see that remnant bride of Christ really come together. Now, we have a long way to go as a church because I tell you, we are so divided that until we become that unified church, that God literally in Jesus in his high priestly prayer said, Father, make them one even as you and I are one. We need that unity. But we're getting there. I believe persecution is what's going to cause the church to come together. And no longer will it be, well, I am Methodist and I am Lutheran and I am Presbyterian and I am Catholic. It'll simply be, guess what? I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I love Jesus. That's what unifies us. Amen? All right, uh, the next block is the Kings of the South. I believe it's South Africa, maybe even Australia. Uh, The Bible predicted about what they would do later on in the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, 1949, the King of the East, China and Southeast Asia begin to rise up. Man, they have the army that the Bible alludes to in the book of Revelation. 200 million man army. Well, it's complete. How could the Bible have known that? There wasn't even 200 million people there (laughs) in those days. 1995, the revived Roman Empire, and we went over this before, but that's the Western European Union that now is uh, part of the European Union, the 10 nations that literally made up the old Roman Empire. And remember document 666 that established this political leader that allows them to enact peace treaties, and we know that the Antichrist in the last days says, watch out for this man, the number of the man is 666. I believe it's very important, potentially even the clue, that that document 666 established this office, and it could be that will be the one who literally brings peace and becomes the false messiah. Could be. I'm not saying for sure, but I think it's very interesting. Babylon, 2003, when we took over Iraq and became the head of Iraq, literally we became the head of Babylon. Now, I don't know if the United States is Babylon of uh, prophecy in the Bible, but I do know this, that Babylon in the last days, it says, is the world consumer of goods. They produce all the filth that the world buys. Guess what? Some of the biggest exports we have is pornography. You know, to a third world country, if they simply watched our our television stations that we watch with our family at night, they would call that pornography. You see, there's so much filth coming from this nation. 2010, the king of the north, Russia began to align with Syria and Iran and Turkey, and they have an alliance right now. Now that is scary because that is the Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39 war. And in 2014, the Psalm 83 nations are coming together. And there are two groups, two different wars. And I believe that's the next war we will see. And ISIS is part of the Psalm 83 nations that will align themselves uh, against Israel. So the stage is set. Israel's back in the land. Syria, Gaza, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan are aligning to come against Israel. Russia and Syria and Iran have come together. Damascus, the oldest perpetually populated city in the world, in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1, it says, will be destroyed and that will be the catalyst that brings Russia down into the conflict because Russia has pledged allegiance with Syria so that they could have a port there uh, at at the tip of Syria. The UN and the globalization of the world's economy, predicted in Scripture. The EU, predicted in Scripture. I believe it's Rome. 
All right, so what do we have? There's a little timeline. Israel was dispersed in 70 A.D. In 660 A.D., what happened? Muhammad started Islam. Okay, long after this Bible was complete. That's Ishmael's descendants and Edom's. Uh, Israel was gathered back together in 1917. Israel became a nation in 1948. And think about the miracle there. Israel had been dispersed since 70 A.D., yet they maintained who they were as a nation. And God called them back together. And that was predicted in Scripture as well. We're going to go over some of those. And so the next prophetic event, I believe, is the Psalm 83 war. And we're going to hopefully get to that this morning. Uh, and we're going to see the rest of those events happen very quickly after the Psalm 83 war happens. Now, the Bible says it's the beginning of birth pains, right? When you hear of wars and rumors of wars. What happens when a woman is pregnant? She's pregnant all these trimesters and semester or whatever those mesters are. <laughs> and, but when the birth pains begin to come, what happens? Everything becomes very quickly and the birth takes place. So the beginning of birth pains are the wars, and I believe it's Psalm 83. And once that happens, the rest of this, like dominoes, is going to happen very quickly. And we will see the last seven years of human history as we know it on this planet. Mm. All right. So uh, we have some former students that are in Iraq this morning with a team. And I wanted to show you a quick video if I can, let's go back. Maybe it's not going to show the video. Uh-oh, Kevin. I think we got to turn that one off, right? Because I played it earlier. Let's turn this one off. Can you guys see that one? Go back slide. And this is Jordan. Oh my goodness, I played it this morning. Okay, I'm just going to exit. Hold on. Hold your horses. Help me out. Play this video. Oh, forget it. No, I'm just shutting that down and we'll play it from my downloads. Now, can you see it? All right. Uh, Jordan and Jessica uh, Danchek are part of this group that's in Iraq. And they've been giving me updates about what's happened. They're about 10 miles from an ISIS stronghold. And they're providing medical assistance. They're providing water and purified water to the soldiers of Iraq that are fighting ISIS. And um, that's Jordan right there. Uh, he used to take classes at Coastland, um, was a part of our spirit seekers. And we need to pray for them. But what they're telling me about, and there was an email going around about, you know, how some of these workers with this organization um, were uh, in a village where they were beheading children's heads. Did you hear about that? Anyone get that email? Okay, part of that email was false, um, uh, but part of it was true. They have beheaded, they've seen about five kids, their heads, uh, and they are doing horrific things. And one of the things they're doing is stopping families, taking their children, raping their daughters, and making them pretty much slaves, and then trying to rec recruit the young kids into ISIS to be fighters. Uh, that's Jessica there. Uh, but I just wanted to show this video so that you would be praying for them. Uh, they're doing a great work over there. You think God has their back? Oh, man, I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I think it would be scary to be in Iraq right now serving the Lord. Sometimes we think we have it bad here. 
You know, and oh, woe is me, what if ISIS comes? Well, you know, as believers there in Iraq, God is protecting them and going before them, and they're seeing many uh, Muslims being converted to Jesus Christ. Amen? So God is doing a great work. So don't give up. And uh, don't worry. Oh, man, there's, I think it'd be a blast to go there. Anyone want to go? <laughs> Kathy? Okay, see me afterwards. We can hook that up. <laughs> Pat's like, no, you're not going. All right, there's some pictures of them there. Jordan and Jessica, pray for them, uh, and their whole team. Um, in fact, let's pray right now. Uh, Father God, we just lift up Jordan and Jessica and the whole team that's there ministering to the uh, Iraqi military, God, and the villages that are fleeing and the refugees, God, that are fleeing ISIS. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them and protect them. God, I pray that you would... Put holy angels, warring angels around about their camp. God, that many would come to know you through the efforts in serving these people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so biblical signs of the end times and how to endure to the end. We've always wondered what the future holds. We know what it holds. And this is going to get really good because we're going to look up quickly the prophecies from 70 A.D. to current. 33 A.D. to 70 A.D., Daniel said in Daniel 9.26, After 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come, speaking of the Antichrist, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So what does that prophecy say? The Messiah is going to come and be killed, cut off. And the people of the prince who is to come, Rome, is going to wipe out the sanctuary and take over Jerusalem. This happened in 70 A.D., exactly as prophesied. So what do we have? In 70 A.D., the Roman army under Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple to suppress an uprising of the Jews. According to historian Josephus, about 1.1 million Jews were killed. Others were taken as slaves, and the rest became part of the diaspora. They started fleeing across the Literally, all the map. The Lord told us that the temple would be destroyed in Matthew 24, 1. Hey, see this temple? Not one stone will be left upon the other. And guess what the Romans did? They took all the stones apart because it was overlaid in gold and they wanted to get all that gold. Um, all right, we were there. That's the Arch of Titus. This is archaeological proof of what the Romans did. Uh, that's what it looks like. By the way, no one in uh, Italy knows what the Arch of Titus is. If you go to Italy, I asked everybody, where's the Arch of Titus? Where's the Arch of Titus? Couldn't find it on a map. Couldn't find it. Asked everybody. They call it Arche di Tito. <laughs> uh, Arche di Tito. Uh, so if you go there, ask for Arche di Tito. Do not ask for the Arch of Titus because no one has a clue what you're talking about which is amazing. But on this arch, see the uh, menorah up there above my head? Can you see it? Okay, this is proof that Israel was a Jewish nation, that Jerusalem was the capital, and there was no other people groups there. Now, there were some on the outskirts, but it establishes that the Jews belong in the land. The Arch of Titus was built uh, by uh, Titus' brother in 82 AD. That's when they built that arch. Pretty cool, right? That's before the book of Revelation was written. All right, that began the great diaspora, which was prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 27 through 30. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you. There you will work, you will do all of that junk. I'm going to protect you. That diaspora happened in 70 AD. Israel had become a wasteland. It was prophesied in Deuteronomy 29, 23. Israel had become a wasteland. Mark Twain wrote in 1867 about the land of Israel. 
Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. The spell of a curse that has withered its fields, fettered its energies. Palestine is a desolate and unlovely. It is hopeless, dreary, heartbroken land. Okay, that was in the 1800s. But the Bible said, when I draw my people back to the land, I'm going to make the desert bloom. So the Bible predicted all of this exactly. Zechariah 8.13, as you've been an object of cursing among the nations, O Judah and Israel, so I will save you. You will be a blessing. Do not be afraid, but let your hands be strong. And God preserved them as a people. We knew that the Palestinians would come and try to take possession of Israel. How do we know it? Ezekiel uh, 36, 5. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely the fire of my jealousy, I've spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom who appropriated my land for themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and with the scorn of soul to drive it out as prey. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains and to the hills, to the ravines, thus says the Lord God, behold, I have spoken of my jealousy and my wrath because you've endured the insults of the nations. And we know that they took possession of the land and now claim it as their own. That's falsehood. Do you know even the Quran says that that land belongs to the Jews? That the Quran says Allah gave Jerusalem and Israel to the Jews. That's in the Quran. 1917, British took control of what is now called Palestine and with the Balfour Declaration of November 2nd, called Jews back to the land of Israel. That is when the end time curtain began, 1917. That's what the uh, declaration looked like. This began the mass exodus of Jews from the north into the promised land. And in 1917, Isaiah 11, 11 and 12 began to be fulfilled. The Lord said, I'll assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather them together, the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Isaiah 11, 12, and he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. That began in 1917. This opened the end time curtain. In 1942, Nazis began to kill the Jews. This was a concentration camp that they just dug up like a few months ago and they found this ring Okay, in Germany. The ring says, Behold, you are consecrated unto me. Isn't that cool? I mean, the cool part is there's proof, and some say that the Jews, the Holocaust, never happened. It's ridiculous. Have you heard this? In 1942, many Jews began to leave where they were comfortable in Germany in the north and fled to Israel. I really believe the Holocaust helped bring the dispersed ones back to the land. God used what was bad for good. Does that make sense? 1947, the UN voted to end British control of Palestine and divide the country into a Jewish and Arab state. In Joel 3, 2, the prophet said, nations will be judged for scattering the people of Israel and having divided or partitioned the land of Israel. And November 29th, 1947, that's exactly what the United Nations proposed was to partition the land of Israel, and that's the partition. Uh, the pink part was uh, going to be Arab, and the green part was going to be Jewish. So guess who controlled Jerusalem there? The Arabs. Can you see it? Kind of right in the middle there. All right, 1948, May 14th, Jews declared their independence. Um, that's when battle broke out. But this is the first time the Jews were a nation for 2,900 years. Think about that. You think God had a hand in that? This people maintained who they were culturally for 2,900 years without a land, without a government, without anything. That is a miracle. All right. Uh, we were the first ones to recognize it. I just love going over this. Uh, that's what Truman typed up on his own typewriter in the White House. You know, 
Uh, the government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the uh, provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. How do you like that? Truman. Gotta love Truman. 1948, the next day, literally uh, war broke out. All the surrounding nations, almost all of them, came against Israel. Israel prevailed. 1967 was the Six-Day War where the Jews recaptured Jerusalem. 1968 to current, Jews began to buy property from the Palestinians. And folks, most of the property they got was salty marshland, desert, like Mark Twain said. It's a barren, desolate, horrible place. You couldn't grow anything there. It wasn't worth anything. So they were gladly selling all the land they could to the Jews. The Bible predicted that fields will be bought for silver in Jeremiah 32, 44, and deeds will be signed, sealed, and witnessed in the territory of Benjamin, in the villages around Jerusalem, in the towns of Judah, in the town of the hill country, the western foothills, the Negev, which is the south. 1982. Hebrew was a lost language. All of a sudden, they reinstituted Hebrew. What did most Jews speak? Yiddish, Russian, German, not Hebrew. Hebrew was lost. And in 1982, they reinstituted the sacred Hebrew language of the Old Testament. Is that a miracle? I, I think it must be. 1983, Israel became the top exporter of pro crops and fruit. Uh, all over the world, uh, you find fruit with, from Israel or the Israel stamp, uh, all of that. They literally made the desert bloom, Isaiah 27, 6. In the days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will bud and blossom and fill the world with its fruit. They're already doing that. Now, that'll be fulfilled exactly at the second coming when Christ establishes his millennial kingdom in Israel, then the world will be filled with the fruit of Israel spiritually and physically. But even now, they're exporting fruit. Isaiah 35, uh, 1 through 2. The desert and parched land will be glad. Oh, I wish Mark Twain could have seen the difference. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will greatly shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord. And as you go from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, the Israeli occupied areas are green and lush. Uh, fruit trees and avocados and pistachios and green lush. You go into the Palestinian uh, controlled areas, desert, rocks, desolate. It's amazing. 1989, the Iron Curtain fell. And many Jews left Russia and went back to Israel at that time. And that was even predicted in Zechariah 2.6. Ho there, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. For I have dispersed you as the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. Isaiah 56.8, the Lord who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them to those already gathered, and this began to be fulfilled in 1989. Wow. So here's the timeline again. We have all of that. Bible says in the last days mankind would change. Isaiah 5, 20 through 23. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Is that happening? Who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. Yes. Who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Man, I, I remember... Uh, when uh, that sa super sour candy came out when Cody was a little boy. What's it called? I mean, so sour you can't even hardly keep it in your mouth. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, I, I was reminded of this verse because it's like the kids liked that nasty, sour. Ugh, ugh, ugh. All right. All right. So what do we have? Ongoing, the partitioning of Israel call for peace. That's going to keep going until the Antichrist finally brings peace. However, at the end of the Psalm 83 war, they are going to have a time of peace. Just a short time before the Gog-Magog, Ezekiel 37, 38, 39 war, 
And then that will be the catalyst for the Antichrist to try to bring peace to the Middle East because the world will either be in or on the verge of World War III. Uh, Babylon rises, Rome established. All of these things were predicted in Scripture and the whole geopolitical climate of the world exactly matches the end time prophecies. It is amazing to look at it and then go like, wow, it's happening. So, I'm just skipping a little bit. Not, nothing big, don't worry. I'll email this PowerPoint out. Is that all right? What do we got? Seven minutes? All right. Today, Muslims have declared holy war, jihad, uh, on Western civilization in Israel. Have you heard that? Okay, I began to listen to um, sermons from imams all over the world, even in moderate mosques. Moderate mosques means that we're a peaceful love. So you, I, I've been listening to these sermons, and they are all crying out, Somewhat for jihad, and jihad simply means struggle. Doesn't mean holy war, doesn't mean anything else. Jihad means struggle. And a real moderate Muslim will say, it means a struggle of your mind, not war. But every imam, every commentator, and every uh, Quranic scholar that I've read calls jihad first a war, and that's the lesser jihad, and then a war within yourself, the greater jihad, but both are jihad. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, um, ISIS and the Muslim Brotherhood. Their motto literally is Allah is our objective, the Prophet is our leader, Quran is our law, and Sharia law is what they're trying to instigate. Jihad is our way, dying in the way of Allah is our highest hope. They believe Islam will rule the world. Islam is more than a religion. It is a military and political system. It is their goal to rule the world. Jihad Academy, when we were in Israel, our, our bus driver, Palestinian, said, oh yeah, my, my boy's in summer camp, learning how to jump out a window and shoot a gun. Uh, cartoons in Palestine. I, have you ever seen the cartoons from Palestine? Where they have these little kids what do you do when you see a Jew? Find a gun and kill them. Little kids, they're teaching them that. Okay. True Islam, peaceful or not? Here's some Quran hermeneutics. Now, we know hermeneutics is how to interpret Scripture. There's a little known hermeneutic rule when an uh, uh, Islamic scholar interprets the Quran, and it's called abrogation. And it's in the Quran. Literally, this is an interpretive rule that declares verses revealed later by Muhammad in Muhammad's career abrogate or cancel or replace earlier verses in the Quran. So think about this. That would be like us saying, well, you know, earlier verses in Matthew, uh, if, if there's a contradiction later, the later verse trumps the old one and we go with the later verse. Okay, so... Early in the Quran, guess what we find? Hey, it's a peaceful religion. You read early in the Quran and it's peaceful and man, if they don't repent, let them have their religion, you have yours and live side by side unless they attack you. Okay, that's early in the Quran. Later in the writings, Muhammad wrote this. Well, here's the verse in the Quran that talks about abrogation. Whatever a verse, revelation, we do, speaking of Allah, abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring a better one or similar to it. Know you not that Allah is able to do all things. So their God can change. Their God is not the same yesterday, today, and forever. Allah in the Quran is not the God that we serve. We serve the one true God that does not change. Okay. Meaning... Well, let's just read it. In uh, Surah 9.5, the Quran says this at the bottom paragraph there. Then when the sacred months, the first, seventh, eleventh, twelfth months of the Islamic calendar have passed, then kill 
the muscular come, unbelievers, wherever you find them, capture them and besiege them and prepare for them each and every ambush. But if they repent and perform the asalat, the Islamic ritual prayers, and give zakat, alms, then leave their way free. Verily, Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. So this later instruction says, kill them, wage war with them, ambush them, unless they will repeat the prayers and pay the tax. Okay. Could a Christian ever do that? No, we could not. In 622 AD, the year of Hira, it's the most significant year in Muhammad's birth and death. In fact, their new year begins there now. They, they measure their calendar after this year, okay, after Hira. And this is when uh, the Quran established global jihad, Sharia law. The author of whatever that says, in describing the rules of jihad, in the Hanaf school said jihad linguistically means to exert one's most effort in word and action. In Sharia, Islamic law, it is fighting of the unbelievers and involves all possible efforts that are necessary to dismantle the power of your enemies of Islam, including beating them, plundering their wealth, destroying their places of worship, smashing their idols. Are they doing that? Oh yeah, they're burning churches. It is far obligatory on us to fight with the enemies. The imam must send a military expedition to the uh, Dar al-Harb, house of war, that's any non-Muslim nations or cities, every year, at least once or twice, and the people must support him in this. If some of the people fulfill the obligation, the remainder are released from the obligation, etc., etc. If no one goes and fight, it is the individual obligation for all Muslims to go fight, just like it's their obligation to pray. All right, so hermeneutically, now, no way is Islam a peaceful uh, religion. Uh, its global dominance of the world is the goal of what they do. All right. September 24th, you ever uh, go to Memory uh, News? M-E-M-R-I? Okay, it's a excellent, it's a, a jihad watch news thing. Um, and uh, the new jihad group uh, in Egypt have pledged their allegiance to ISIS, and they call themselves the Caliphate Army of Egypt. Now, the Caliphate is the one religious leader that will rule the world under Islam. And so now Egypt, we have ISIS having a, a good presence, and a lot of them are Muslim Brotherhood guys that have now joined ISIS and pledged their allegiance to the Caliphate. The reason why Hamas won't is because they don't believe that this man is the caliphate. They're waiting. The reason why Al-Qaeda won't, they don't believe that this man leading ISIS is the caliphate. They're still waiting for another one. So, all right. Right now, nations are lining up just as the Bible predicted. The Psalm 83 war, I believe, is the next prophetic event. And what we find is some very interesting stuff. Psalm 83, who wrote it? Asaph wrote it. Uh, he was a Levite, one of the leaders of David's choir. First Chronicles 6.39. He wrote Psalms 50 and 73 through 83. He not only was a musician, but he was a prophet or a seer. Second Chronicles 29.30. And Psalm 83 is all about his prophetic vision of this end time war that I believe will be the catalyst for Gog Magog and eventually the Antichrist. It says, Behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have exalted themselves. They make shrewd plans against your people and conspire together against your treasured ones. They have said, Come, let us wipe them out as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. You ever hear that in headlines? I found so many quotes, almost verbatim, from mosques all over the world quoting exactly that verse. I don't think they know they're quoting this verse. <laughs> For they have conspired together with one mind. Against you they make a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, 
Moab and the Hagrites, Gegel, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, and the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria has joined with them, and they have become a help to the children of Lot. So what do we have there? Oh, that one still didn't come on. Sorry. What, all, those are all the immediate nations right around Israel, and they are not included in the Ezekiel 37-38 Gog-Magog war. Two different wars, two different groups of nations. Okay, that exact battle in Psalm 83.6 has never happened in history. There was one that almost did, but it didn't in Chronicles. Isaiah 17 verses 12 through 14 also talk about that war. And in Isaiah 17, 1, we read about Damascus being removed from being a city. That's all going to be part of that war. That's the hook that draws Russia down. All right. So who are these nations? Edom, Ishmaelites. Hey, they're all the people we've just been studying in Genesis 35 and 36. Real quick. Tents of Edom are the Palestinians, South Jordanians. Uh, Ishmaelites are the Saudis. Moab is the Palestinians and Central Jordanians. Hagarites, Hagarenes are the Egyptians. Gebel is Hezbollah uh, and North Lebanese, including Western Iraq, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS could be part of that now. I added that in. Uh, Ammon, Philistines, and Northern Jordanians. Amalek, the Arabs of the Sinai area. Philistia is the exact area of the Gaza Strip. Isn't that amazing? I mean, who knew? Well, obviously God did. That the Gaza Strip, even though Israel would control the whole land, wouldn't control that section of the land. It's the Gaza Strip. Um, Hezbollah and South Lebanon uh, and Assyria is the Syrians and northern Iraqis. Okay, they're going to come against Israel. That's the next battle uh, coming up, and we may even see it happen. Who knows? So there you go. That's kind of what it looks like there. That's a lot of big nations coming against that little nation, isn't it? But they will prevail. What do we have, two minutes? So Jordan's the only holdout. Uh, Jordan is still an ally of Israel. In fact, they are doing sorties over Syria fighting ISIS right now. Okay, so uh, we got to keep our eye on Jordan. Uh, the minute they decide to go against Israel, we'll have all those nations in agreement to wipe Israel out as a nation. Okay. And what do we got? Two minutes? Eh. All right. I'm going to finish this next week. How about that? All right, so... We made it there. We made it pretty far. Ah, why don't we stand? So in light of all of this, I just want to say two things. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the second thing is fear not. Bible sometimes says that, right? Yeah, it's the most repeated command in all of Scripture. Fear not. I believe it is now more than ever time to stand tall as believers and Christians. We can use these prophecies that are being fulfilled all around us as a great tool to evangelize, as a great tool to share our faith. Amen. Comforts me, strengthens and restores my soul, satisfies my needs. Thank you for listening to Staying the Course with Pastor Brett Peterson. If you would like a copy of this message or would like to submit a prayer request or comment, contact us at 949-888-5777 or email us at info at ccbcu.edu. God bless you as you seek and serve Him. Remember, stay the course, and we'll see you next week. I love your word, I love the way it comforts me, strengthens and restores my soul.
satisfies my needs.